it becomes increasingly unequal because that's what human beings do. So let's just begin with our first overall theme, which is, is it a mistake in the current circumstances to focus on productivity in the first place? Daniel. Well, I think it depends on who you are and where you are. Um, if you're living, there are still 10% of the world's population, which is nearly a billion people who live on under $2 a day. Those people desperately need increases in productivity. Um, one might serve their interests by redistributing to them, but productivity is a much more politically palatable and effective way of removing really material misery that a billion people are subject to. On the other hand, for people elsewhere in the world, um, not all work is best understood in that way. Let me give one brief example and then I'll, I'll stop. Think about the difference between the way in which a heart surgeon and a nurse works with a patient who has an unhealthy heart. The heart surgeon has no relationship with the patient. She simply sees an unconscious person, cuts the person open, stitches them back up, and the value of that person's work is measured in productivity. How much does their intervention improve the health of the person? The nurse helps the person restructure their lives, change their diet, change their exercise, reduce their stress, and the value of the nurse's work, his work depends on forming a relationship with the patient. And the relationship is valuable, not just as a means to the end of the patient's health. And so for those people, measuring work in terms of productivity mismeasures something that's extremely important. And if we have more time, we can talk about what share of the economy either is or should be structured in this non-instrumental way, as opposed to in the instrumental way. So you, you mentioned there are a billion uh, people who you thought could required productivity. Are you saying the other seven billion shouldn't be focused on productivity? No. So I think there are a billion people who are living under two dollars a day, roughly. There are a lot more people who are living below the threshold at which they don't need more stuff. And those people also need more output or redistribution to make their lives materially better. But there are many people, including I suspect many people in this room, who are living at a point at which what is most important in making their lives go better is not extracting more income by exploiting their own labor, but rather finding ways to do tasks that they think are intrinsically meaningful, that forge valuable relationships with others in the doing of them, that create democracy and meaning in their lives. And for those people, productivity is not the principal driver of their well-being going forward and shouldn't be what they aim at, although for a variety of structural reasons, our political economy and our social morality trains us to aim at productivity. You seem, though, to indicate that you, that means most of the people in the richer nations in the world. I don't know if I would say most of the people, because there's a lot of maldistribution in the richer nations of the world, too. And so, so give us a, a sense of what, what sort of numbers are you, are you talking about, what percentage? So, are so I think it's hard to be precise, and I'm not trying to avoid the question. <laughs> but but um, in the UK, uh, people on a household income of, let's say, over 80,000 pounds a year, in the US $100,000 a year, which puts you in roughly the top third of the distribution, above the mean, but not in the narrow elite. These are people whose lives would be better improved by focusing on community and meaning than on additional income. But it's important to understand that there's a structural problem here, which is that we have a labor market and we have a society which does not give many opportunities for the kinds of meaning-making work that I'm describing. And so even if, in principle, people would be better off doing this sort of work, it's not clear that it's available to them. There's not an employer who will give them that job or a location in which they can do it. OK. So, uh, Martin, for, for a significant proportion of people, then, Daniel's asking, uh, uh, saying we shouldn't be pursuing productivity. Would you agree? Up to a point. Um, a lot of up to a points on the panel. I, 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 I will do my best to clarify our positions. Martin. Well, I tend to think that I, this is where I've ended up now in my late 70s, that most of life consists of painful trade-offs without simple answers. I hate to say that, and I'm not going to change that view just because you'd like me to. Uh, the, um, so I do think that... Well, first of all, I want to emphasize very strongly what Daniel started with, 
I started my life as a development economist. It's remained a dominant concern of mine. And I would have made exactly the same point that had another minute on the, uh, and I'm very delighted Daniel did, on where we started 200 years ago. Because the tendency of some people to regard all the material and associated progress of the last 200 years as a snare and delusion is, a, to put it mildly, a very serious mistake. Among other things, about 80% of you would not be alive. The population growth, obviously, is a function of that. One of the problems created, success creates problems. Uh, and um, in addition to the bottom billion who are borderline destitute, the sort of people who, as a result of COVID and the disruption of COVID, have died in very large numbers, which we don't think about. I've written about this. So poverty matters, right? And the ability to cope with trauma like COVID for societies was immeasurably increased by the fact that we're just so rich. We could do something, I'm not saying it was wise or not, but we couldn't have even imagined before, which was in response to a major disease, close down large parts of the economy and stay at home. That's because we were so rich and productive and other countries couldn't. And I would say something like three quarters to 80% of humanity, and that would be consistent with Daniel's figures, are still in the, the realm in which Higher output per head will make a great deal of difference. The second point I would make is even if we don't want productivity per head in aggregate, we still need a hell of a lot of innovation, which is really what productivity is about. To me, it's the ability to do more with less. Now, to take one example, we wanted to, which is pretty crucial, and I discuss at great length in this book, uh, which is. We need an energy revolution. We all agree with that. We're going to have to move away from a fossil fuel-based economy to a renewables-based economy. Because the alternative, of course, is massively to shrink the energy input into our economies. And I promise you that will make us very much poorer in all sorts of obvious ways. Just think about all the ways you use energy, heating and cooling and refrigeration and transport and so forth. That will take a monstrous technological revolution. Uh, we are making quite a lot of progress in that, but that will all go into higher productivity. If we are successful, we could in, even in theory have limitless free energy or something like it. Let's suppose we did do that. That'd be terrific. It would be a colossal increase in productivity, by the way, which we could take, and that's the final point, which we could take in a number of different ways. We could decide not to consume more, but just live lives of greater leisure. Uh, we could decide to pay more to people who we do think are doing rather valuable things of the type you mentioned. These are social decisions. But the point I'm making is that in these two pretty clear dimensions, uh, the energy revolution we desperately need and the state of the vast number of still very poor people in the world, um, I would say something like 80% of humanity, productivity really matters. What we do with it, that's the really big social question. And do you think that as far as governments are concerned, they should be focused on productivity, given your, you know, there are areas where you think, well, productivity is not the only thing that we should be pursuing, but should governments be focusing on productivity for those nations in the West who are relatively wealthy? Let me give an, I hate to say this, well, there are two aspects to this. One which we haven't got into is the crude politics of our society. If we decide not, well, let's get away the productivity question, let's decide that we want a zero growth economy. It's not the same thing as I've tried to suggest. But let's suppose we do. Then all distributional, all questions in the society around politics and so forth become by their nature zero sum. Because you're not going to have more output. So if you're going to give more to some people, you're going to take away from others. And my view is, like it or not, that one of the reasons we managed our democratic system reasonably successfully and got it survived democracy is a freak historically is that we have positive sum society so getting rid of output increases will create very large political challenges and we're seeing this in britain now the second point i would make 
is considered one of the most... So does that mean that governments do have to focus on... They, that if they don't, there will be... No, but big, does that mean that they, they do have don't, to... they will have to face some other very big challenges. And so I think they do have to increase okay. output, if ideally subject to the constraint of how they organize the society to do so and how they use the resource, what they do with the resources that go into it. Those are very big, important issues. The only other point I would make is, let's suppose we could revolutionize health. So most of the things we need to do in health could be done vastly more efficiently, efficiently vastly more cheaply with a, a few pills. Okay. We would want that, wouldn't we? Okay. Madeleine, we do need productivity. Governments need to focus on productivity. I think it's very easy to, to bash productivity, um, especially from a, from a non-economic point of view. Like if you're talking about values, then that's a particularly easy, easy bashing <laughs> um, because there's all sorts of um, problems with how productivity is, um, is used or how productivity figures are used now. Um, I would say that there are lots of reasons why we should be... Um, why we should view productivity as a friend. So, of course, so things like um, part of the reason why our productivity um, is potentially low is because we're not investing enough. We're not investing enough in skills, in management. So those things, they're really good. <laughs> I, you know, it, you can't say, no, we don't, want, um, we don't want higher productivity. But yes, we do want all the things that, <laughs> that, that productivity will bring without a little bit of um, sort of cohering those positions. But I suppose that is more or less my position with some caveats that basically the the, the fruits of or rather the, the foundations of productivity in our country are clearly good things to aim at and it could be our and it could be our friend um, but I mean it's interesting you said about sort of you know you can do more with less I think the problem is that we don't do more with less we actually focus on putting more in and getting more and then we might do with less somewhere down the line but actually we never really get to the well. Why don't we try doing more with? Why don't we try doing with less, <laughs> less than? So I think that there needs to be. Um, I mean, that ultimately is in the realm of culture rather than the government. But the government will have a role here, particularly um, sort of greening the economy. That's a huge challenge, which obviously the government's going to have to lead. Okay, Daniel, we Can should I? be focusing on productivity. Yeah, I want to say something to Martin's observation about the zero-sum world and the politics, which I think identifies maybe the central political challenge for the rest of this century. And when one talks about a zero-sum world in the absence of new gains in productivity, one is measuring the sum in terms of money, in terms of GDP measured by dollars. And as long as GDP is measured in that way and the sum is measured in that way, we will be in a zero-sum world if we can't grow and increase productivity. And the politics will be extremely dark for all the reasons that Martin identifies. Uh, at the same time, there are other ways to think about the total or aggregate well-being of a civilization. And before 1800, no civilization would have thought of its well-being in terms of GDP. And there are ways to lead a positive-sum world, even without increasing GDP, if we measure the sums by human flourishing, by connections, by the, the substantive well-being of the civilization that we manage to produce. The difficulty is, you know, if wishes were horses, then beggars would ride. And the, the zero-sum view, the GDP view, is the product of two centuries of intellectual work, of institution building, and of enormously morally and politically potent cultural development and identifying that it will become a problem once growth stops is not the same thing as constructing the imaginative alternative that we will need to survive that problem. Uh, my view is one of the great tasks of intellectuals of the moment is to start working towards that alternative. But to be responsible in that, one has to acknowledge both the enormous moral achievement of the market-based view and the fact that we are still living in it and wishing we weren't won't get us out of it, and denying its accomplishments won't make us help us to see the problems that need to be solved as we do get out of it. Okay, so, so sorry, Martin. This is really, really important because I think, and it's probably a point, we need disagreement. So this is, uh, because this is an incredibly important issue. I agree completely about the way we frame GDP, and that, but I won't go into that. So in the, all the many centuries before anybody invented GDP, um, what was society like? And I would say 
it behaved exactly as one would expect uh, a society with very, very limited wealth and a very limited number of people who controlled the wealth, kings and aristocrats with a few others, to behave. They didn't need to know GDP. They knew they wanted everything. And the, so one of the most fascinating pieces of historical research, and this is increasingly now empirically supported, is the, the organized societies, and I'm not talking, you know, so large states and so forth, in the pre-modern period were as unequal as they could be. That is to say, 80 to 90% of the population, uh, the people um, Dan was talking about, lived on the more margin of survival, and most of them were agricultural laborers. All their surplus was extracted by the top. That was the ultimate zero-sum society, and it became maximally unequal. So my concern, my concern is when we go, since I'm a pessimist, when we go to our new zero-sum society, and I think we've been moving for it towards it over the last 30 or 40 years, it becomes increasingly unequal because that's what human beings do. And the extractive regime at the top, and there are many examples of this, becomes the dominant mode. So while I would like to believe, you know, in the, in the, in this glorious moral revolution, I am deeply concerned that as we become more static, we go back to the zero sumness of the 17th, 16th, 15th century or ancient China, one of the most extreme examples in history. And that really is something we have to think about. So, so this is extremely important and we agree in some ways and disagree in others. Um, here's where we agree. One of the things that the productivity revolution and the market societies that produced it have achieved is to corral the process of getting for me into a form that has some positive product for others, as opposed to the prior ways of doing this, which were purely extractive, self-interested, and exploitative, and therefore very damaging. So I think we agree about that. Um, the place where we might disagree, and I don't know how deeply, uh, you know, it's a little bit it's old Hegel, you know, thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The future cannot be a return to the past for all the reasons Martin identifies and a thousand others also, including that moral pluralism has let a certain cat out of the bag that the past controlled by suppressing. But at the same time, I don't think we should be trapped in the tyranny of no alternatives and think that the way in which people were before 1800 is the way in which we naturally or inevitably are. Uh, the way in which people naturally are is probably the way in which they ordinarily are. That is to say, we're enormously malleable by our social circumstances. And uh, it is a hopeful thing to say that we can create social circumstances that will shape us in a way that managed to retain the gains for cohesion and other regardingness of the productivity revolution while discarding what are now the costs. There's no certainty that we can do that, but we have no alternative but to work in that direction because the alternative is environmental calamity and collapse for all of us. So maybe your pessimism is right, Martin, maybe it's not. In some sense, I'm not sure it matters. We have to act as if it's not right in our motives while retaining all the skepticism in order that we can act effectively. For podcasts, talks, debates, courses and articles, visit the Institute of Art and Ideas. Click the link on screen now to iai.tv.